Gibra. Uh, there is a press conference for the first time. That you may bump into somebody with press credentials, and that's because there's a lot of interest in us, and so you may be interviewed. Um, don't say anything you wouldn't want to be quoted. It's a mistake I've made in the past. And finally, there's a NIPS party on Saturday to celebrate the end of the uh, NIPS workshop organized by uh, Michael Jordan. And he will personally be on stage playing riffs for you. Okay, now I'd like to turn it over now to our general chairs, uh, Isabel Guillaume and Ulrika von Luxburg. Yeah, good evening, everybody. It's really great to talk in front of such a big crowd. I'm Ulrike von Luxburg, and jointly with Isabel Guillaume, we've been the general chairs of this conference. And being general chairs is really a very good job because the major part of your job is to appoint people to do the big part of the work. And so these were the people we appointed and we really want to thank all of them. So there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into organizing such a conference. There's all the local the logistics, which has been dealt by Mary Ellen and also the IT infrastructure by Lee. Then we had the program chairs, which did the major work this year to review all these papers, like the, I don't know how many thousand, three, so three and a half thousand papers or so, organized this whole reviewing process, and we can just um, consider what they've been going through because we've done it last year. So this was a huge amount of work. It was Sammy, Rob, Vichy, and Hannah. Then we had tutorial chairs, Jen and Sammy, who organized what you've seen already today. Then we have workshop chairs, Ralph and Suchi, who, um, who uh, organized all the workshops on Friday and Saturday and also the reviewing process for the workshops. We have demo and competition chair, Sergio and Marcus. And we have a press chair new this year, Neil and Catherine, who organized all the contacts to the press. A publication chair, Roman, who, who is dealing with the NIPS proceedings. And then the program managers, June and Daniel. So let's thank all of them by giving them a big applause. Good evening, so I, I had the pleasure of working with Ulrike this year. My name is Isabel Guillon. And uh, each year, the program chairs have to distinguish themselves by innovating a little bit, bringing some new things to NIPS. I hope that uh, all of the young people who are coming now, they will one day also contribute some new ideas. And um, you're very welcome also to make suggestions. So this year, our, our contribution was to introduce a competition track. And uh, we uh, have, the, with the help of uh, Sergio Escalera and Marcus Weimer, who are competition chairs this year, um, brought to life five competitions out of 23 proposals. The uh, first one is the uh, computational intelligence uh, track, uh, which uh, is uh, trying to have people create uh, automatic uh, conversations, so-called chatbots and uh, trying to break the Turing tests. So I, I am very uh, impatient to know how well they, they've been doing. Another uh, natural language processing competition is the human question and answer competition. In this competition, they are having a computer um, play the game quiz ball, which is uh, similar to Jeopardy. So you may remember a few years ago that um, uh, IBM had uh, their computer compete in such a Jeopardy competition. So now everybody can try to beat uh, uh, humans in a quiz ball competition. And uh, uh, in that uh, competition, the answers are progressively unveiled and you have to, um, uh, a text is progressively unveiled and the uh, participant needs to give the answer as quickly as possible. It was one of the winners of uh, a demo in NIPS 2015. Another uh, type of competition in reinforcement learning is the learning to run. And here the goal was to train a human avatar to learn with uh, pure reinforcement learning. There was a competition on personalized medicine where the goal was to uh, uncover how from uh, genotyping patients you could uh, personalize 
which drugs you need and in which amount uh, in order to fight uh, cancer more effectively without incurring toxic effects. And uh, finally, the last competition was about adversarial attacks and uh, defense. And that competition was both fun and serious. Uh, the uh, goal was to take images and make imperceptible changes to them and trick the classifier into thinking it's something different. So the uh, serious aspect of it is imagine that you have uh, road signs and you could make very, very little changes and fool um, image classifi classifier into thinking it's something completely different and give wrong directions. So this could be extremely dangerous in, um, for, you know, uh, circulations. So um, I hope, you know, you, you'll enjoy um, knowing what the outcomes of these competitions are and join us in f Friday for the uh, workshop. And as a Terry announced already, so <laughs> he um, um, stole us the scoop. We have, you know, this uh, deep art competition and uh, you will enjoy seeing the uh, selected posters that are around the uh, poster area on the outside of the uh, Pacific Ballroom. And we ask you to join us and vote for the best poster. The winner for the best poster will have a free dinner. So uh, please uh, uh, enter the, you know, the uh, vote by um, uh, selecting the number and you'll have a, 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 a voting page that you can reach. Instructions are you know, at the entrance of the Pacific Ballroom. Yes, and the last new thing this year is the party we want to have on Saturday evening. I always thought on the last nips is that it's such a pity that everybody disappears to their own private party on the last evening of this conference. So this time we are trying to have one joint party with 8,000 people. I'm really curious how this is going to turn out, but please all just come and then we just make a party. And with this, we now hand over the words to the program chairs of this year. Enjoy the conference. Uh, just one thing I forgot. <laughs> Uh, the uh, competition on conversational intelligence, they are looking for judges to help them judge, you know, whether the dialogues are natural. So you can go on the uh, competition page and you can volunteer to participate in uh, becoming a judge. So thank you very much. So welcome everyone, my name is Sami Bengio and um, let me start by uh, telling you uh, when about a year ago I was uh, called by the NIBS board to ask if I wanted to, to become the program chair. I asked the only question I usually ask in these cases, are you sure you're talking about me and not my brother? <laughs> Turned out it was me. So then the next decision was okay, so this looks like a dentist. Uh, Dantesque job, so I need to find not only one person to help me, but, but more. So I think at that point, this was the most important decision I had to take. Who could help me doing this very difficult job? And um, I'm very happy to, to say uh, that I chose, I think, the best three person to help me. So uh, uh, please help me in uh, thanking them. Uh, Rob Fergus, Vichy Vishwanathan, and Hannah Wallach. I think we had a good team and I think uh, it was very, very, very useful to have them. That said, we're not going to only thank ourselves, there's plenty of other people to thank and yes, you've already thanked them but I think we, they deserve more than that so uh, I'm going to go over many other people who helped us. In particular, we had the help of two workflow managers, Danny Hill and Chun Hui Teo. They actually did all the technical things, uh, scripting, uh, sending emails, uh, playing with CMT, so many technical things that we would never have been able to do without them. So thanks to Dan and Chinui. <laughs> and of course, there's uh, all the technical, the, the staff at NIPS that are wonderful. I mean, Mary Ellen, Lee, Terry, and all the board, they were always uh, present to, to help us and, uh, and uh, 
answer questions that were very hard and uh, all the logistic of the conference, which as you can see this year is, is great. So thanks, thanks all of you. <laughs> the general chairs, uh, Ule said that it's the easiest job, but actually they were present every time we had a question, every time there was something like critical, they would answer, they would uh, reassure us that we were doing the right thing or not. <laughs> but they were really very helpful uh, for any very uh, uh, adv invaluable advice. Uh, at, the, at the rather end of the process, we had uh, the help of uh, Roman Garnett, who helped us pushing everything from CMT to the NIP site, and that was uh, very important. There was a lot of things to do. In particular, there was novelties because we pushed more than just the papers. In some cases, we pushed uh, uh, videos and, uh, and links to posters and links to open source code, and, and Roman was, uh, was very useful for doing that. And finally, of course, there's all these reviewers, all the all those reviewers that we had to ask at the last minute because we needed more reviews, all the RH chairs, senior RH chairs, and of course, authors. All of these are, are making what NIPS is today. So uh, thanks, all of you guys. So let's talk about the conference itself, the thing you came for today. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's the biggest NIP ever, 8,000 registration. It's going up and up and up. <laughs> and well, actually, if, we <laughs> if it's going like that, we're going to have a problem. In about 2035, we're going to have as many persons at NIP that there is in, in the world. Um, and if you continue after that, <laughs> maybe the rest will be attended by robots, actually. Who knows? <laughs> But in any case, not only we think it's the biggest NIPS, we think it's going to be the best NIPS ever. Uh, there are many super exciting things happening. For instance, we have seven invited speakers. Uh, the first one will happen like in a few minutes only. We have uh, two parallel tracks. There was too many good talks to see, so we couldn't fit them into one track. So there will be two parallel tracks like last year. And of course, there will be uh, three uh, poster sessions, one each day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, so with that, I'm going to let Hannah continue. All right. What's up, NIPS? It's going to be great. Come on, people. OK, um, so I'm Hannah, and I'm going to tell you about this year's NIPS review process, starting with submissions. Okay, so after deleting test submissions, submissions with no PDF and stuff like that, we ended up with 3,240 papers to be sent out for review. This was a record-breaking number of submissions, a 30% increase over last year, and almost twice as many submissions as this year's ICML. Yeah, just saying. <laughs> Uh, so in order to help us assign submissions to appropriate reviewers and area chairs, we revamped the NIPS subject areas this year. And this resulted in a hierarchy of 156 uh, lower level subject areas and nine top level subject areas. And with 156 of these lower level subject areas, this was a 150% increase over last year. So we're not going to show you the numbers of submissions for all of those 156 areas, but here are the numbers for the nine top level areas. And amazingly, deep learning did not receive the most submissions. So who are these papers by? Well, in total, there are around 10,000 non-unique authors. So that's around 3.4 authors per paper. After deduplication, we ended up with 7,844 unique authors. But who are these people? Well, to figure this out, we looked at a random sample of 10% of the submissions. And just to reassure you, we compared a whole bunch of statistics to make sure that our sample was indeed representative. Sammy then painstakingly hand categorized each of these papers' authors. Yes, really, he did that, as if he did not have enough to do already. 
What we found was that there were just under 10% of authors were women, while just over 90% of authors are men, that we do recognize that binarizing gender is problematic. We also found that around 12% of authors have industry affiliations, while 88% have academic affiliations. But of course, there's no way to list multiple affiliations in CMT, so this is likely slightly off. All right, so what about reviews? This year, we had 2,093 expert reviewers, ranging from senior PhD students to full professors or the industry equivalent. And unlike last year, we chose not to use any volunteer reviewers. Where possible, we also tried to ensure that reviewers had already published in top-tier venues such as NIPS, ICML, CVPR, ACL, and so on. The reviewers were overseen by 183 area chairs, which is an increase of 83% over last year because we wanted to keep their workloads reasonably manageable, even with the increased number of submissions. And when selecting these area chairs, we tried as best as possible to ensure diversity along a variety of different axes. We also introduced a new role this year, senior area chair. We had 26 senior area chairs, each responsible for managing roughly seven area chairs. And by introducing the senior area chair role, we were able to make the conference double blind at the level of area chairs, which is a first for NIPS. The senior area chairs also helped us calibrate scores across the area chairs during the decision-making process. And again, when selecting these senior area chairs, we again tried to ensure diversity. So unlike in previous years, we used a mixed integer linear program written by SAMI to assign submissions to reviewers and area chairs and to assign area chairs to senior area chairs. And this enabled us to introduce a number of new constraints to the assignment process. So first, like usual, we wanted to make sure that there were no conflicts of interest. But this year, we also augmented the conflicts stated by authors with additional conflicts derived from co-authorship information from the past three years, kindly provided to us by A minor. Second, we also wanted to maximize positive bids and avoid negative bids. Third, we wanted there to be no more than two reviewers from any particular institution assigned to any submission. And finally, we wanted to make sure that each reviewer was assigned no more than six submissions, each area chair was assigned no more than, eight, uh, sorry, than 18 submissions, and each senior area chair was assigned no more than eight area chairs. And by using a mixed integer linear program, rather than the assignment algorithm built into CMT, we were able to satisfy these additional constraints, as well as relying on subject areas and information derived from TP TPMS, like usual. So at the end of the reviewing process, we ended up with a total of 9,747 reviews. That's at least three per submission, and in a few cases, four or five. Okay, so what about acceptances? After a set of meetings with the 26 senior area chairs and a bunch of back and forth to make sure that reviewers' scores were calibrated, we ended up with 679 papers accepted for presentation, which corresponds to a 19% increase over last year. With 3,240 submissions and 679 acceptances, the acceptance rate for this year's conference was 21%, a slight decrease over last year. One of our other innovations this year was to reintroduce spotlights. We also lengthened each spotlight slot and shortened each oral slot to provide more opportunities for authors to present their work in a meaningful fashion. And with these changes, we ended up with 40 papers accepted as orals, 112 as spotlights, and 527 as posters. Okay, so then what about acceptances by subject area? Well, again, we're not going to show you acceptances for all 156 lower level subject areas, but here are the numbers for the nine top level areas. And I want to note that the acceptance rates are all pretty comparable across these areas. So before we move on, we also want to highlight another change we made this year. 
As many of you know, there is nothing worse than getting your paper accepted to NIPS and then having to simultaneously add content to address the reviewer's co comments and remove content in order to add in author affiliations. So, inspired by ACL and other NLP conferences, we gave authors a ninth content page for their camera-ready papers this year. And while making this change, we also learned that NIPS actually still produces printed proceedings. Last year's took up eight inches of shelf space, and this year's will likely take up at least 10.63 inches. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna hand over to Vishy. Um, so usually the area chairs uh, at uh, NIPS run some kind of an experiment, but uh, this year we decided not to run an experiment, but to collect some data. Um, so some of you may have noticed that uh, we asked you about uh, whether your papers were posted on archive, and if you were reviewing, we asked whether uh, you saw the paper on archive. So uh, based on the responses, we figured out that 43% uh, of the papers were posted online on archive or some other forum somewhere else, and 57% of the posters, of course, were not posted else, uh, outside. Uh, we also asked the reviewers uh, for when they were submitting the individual reviews whether they had seen a paper that they were reviewing posted elsewhere. Uh, about 10% of the reviews of the 9,747 reviews, uh, the reviewers indicated that they had seen the paper elsewhere. Right? And uh, of course we want to know whether uh, posting on archive has any effect on the submission rates or not. Just to uh, remind you, 21% uh, of the, uh, was the acceptance rate in general for the overall uh, conference. And uh, if you condition on the papers that were not posted online, uh, the submission rate drops down to 15%. On the other hand, if you look at the papers that were posted online, the submission rate actually jumps to 29%. So this is a significant jump. There are many, many hypotheses that you can uh, fit to this data. They're all consistent with this. Perhaps people who post on uh, archive are uh, much more uh, polished papers are being submitted. They have already been, uh, you know, they've already been vetted. Uh, maybe they're not doing the last minute panic and like uh, <laughs> running their experiments and at uh, the nth minute. Uh, perhaps uh, there are other, other factors there, but uh, that's, that's something to think about. Now, uh, we wanted to dig in further and see uh, wh what is the, so among the papers that were posted online, uh, is there a difference between the papers for which the review, uh, one or more of the reviewers has seen the paper before or not? So among the papers that were posted online, if uh, the papers where a reviewer had not seen the paper, the acceptance rate was 25%. This was slightly higher than the 21% for the overall conference. But for those papers where it was posted online and the reviewers had seen, at least one or more of the reviewers had seen the paper uh, online, uh, the acceptance rate actually jumped up to 35%. So this is almost 20% uh, higher than uh, that for papers that were not posted online and almost 10% higher than the posters that were posted online but were not seen by reviewers. Again, there are a number of possible hypotheses uh, that uh, could fit this data, but this is something for all of us to think about. So with that, uh, I want to hand over to Rob to do the pleasant job of announcing the awards. Okay, so the final thing to do is to announce the awards for this year. So first up, um, there were 76 reviewers that were nominated by area chairs and senior area chairs for providing consistently high quality and thoughtful reviews. And of course, you know, high quality reviewing is essential for the success of NIPS. And so we'd like to recognize them with um, some best reviewer awards. And so here are their list of their names. So let's give them a round of applause for their efforts. <clears throat> So I'm not going to read them all out, um, but uh, the, their names will be up on the NIPS website for you to see. Okay, so next, there were three best, paper, best papers this year, all equally meritorious, 
Uh, they were selected by the program chairs uh, on the basis of recommendations from the senior area chairs and the area chairs, as well as high scores and strong reviews. Um, so uh, we do want to point out that in the printed uh, booklet, there's in fact a mistake. Uh, they are in fact best paper awards, not best student paper awards. Um, and I'm going to just announce them in the order in which they'll be presented at the conference. So the first one is safe and nested subgame solving for imperfect information games by Noam Brown and Thomas Santholm. <laughs> now this paper is going to be presented tomorrow at 2:50 p.m. in Hall C, and the, author, the, the authors of the paper can collect their certificate and prize check at, at that time. Okay, so the next one is a linear time kernel goodness of fit test by Wittewat Jit Kritum, Wen Kai Shu, Zoltan Sabo, and Kenji Fukumizu, and Arthur Gretton. And this paper will be presented tomorrow at 4.20 p.m. in Hall C. And the third paper is variance-based regularization with convex objectives by Hong Siok Nang Kung, and John Ducci. <laughs> and this paper is going to be presented on Wednesday at 10.50 a.m. in Hall A. And so the final award is a test of time prize that we decided to introduce this year. And the winning paper was selected by a committee of NIPS board members uh, from a shortlist of highly cited NIPS papers from 10 years ago, plus or minus one year, to give some margin. And the winning paper is Random Features for Large-Scale Kernel Machines by Ali Rahimi and Ben Recht from NIPS 2007. Uh, now, the authors will be giving a short talk about this paper and its impact over the last 10 years um, tomorrow at 9.50 a.m. here in Hall A. Okay, so that's it. Um, that's it from us. Thank you, thanks very much and hope you enjoy the conference. So we're going to start the, the conference itself, and we start with our first invited speaker. Uh, so uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, John Platt. Uh, John uh, has been uh, in our community for uh, many, many, many years. He was actually a program chair uh, a bit more than 10 years ago. Uh, but he also uh, did a lot of uh, interesting contributions. Uh, I'm thinking, for instance, of uh, SMO, for those of you who were here in the SVN time. So an algorithm to help uh, efficiency in training as uh, VNs. Uh, he also introduced uh, what became called, without him uh, liking it, the PLAT scaling, an approach to transform scores into calibrated scores, for instance, probabilities. Uh, but actually, John has uh, been contributing to many, many uh, fields, uh, like uh, computational geometry, object recognition, signal processing, analog computation, handwriting recognition, applied math, Lots of things. Uh, not only that, he actually discovered two asteroids, and uh, he also got a Technical Academy Award in 2006 for his uh, work in computer graphics. So he has a very wide range of interest. More recently, he joined the Applied Science branch. Uh, he leads the Applied Science branch of uh, Google Research, and uh, where he works on the interaction between computer science and physical or biological science. Please help me in welcoming John. Thanks, Sammy. Apparently, I have to announce that there's uh, more seating in the overflow room, so you don't need to stand here. There's another room, I think, uh, by there. I see people going there. So if you go there, you will uh, be able to seat. And we want you to be comfortable for my talk. Well, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. This is quite a delight. I love NIPS. And uh, I'd like to tell you about some of the work I've been doing in the last couple of years, me and uh, uh, colleagues, about how to power the next 100 years of human civilization. 
So let me start by telling you the world I'd like to live in. Uh, I'd like to live in a world where everyone on Earth can use as much energy as I do as a US resident. And why do I want that? Well, because it's relatively evident that a high uh, level of energy use is a necessary condition for a high standard of living. And I'd love to have everyone on the planet to have a high standard of living. Now, is this an unreasonable goal? Is this something that would never happen? Well, let's look at the historical uh, graph of how much power is consumed by all of humankind. Here it is, it's, uh, over the last 50 years. Uh, Y-axis is in a log scale, and it's in units of terawatts, or trillions of watts. And if you look at this, it's a log linear scale, and so it's a rough line, and, and power consumption has been increasing by about 2.2% per year. If you extrapolate that for the next 100 years, you'll see right now we're using about 18 terawatts of power. And by 2100, uh, we, if we keep going at this rate, we'll use about 113 terawatts of power, which in fact is very close to the US power rate for 11.2 billion people, which are the expected population in 2100. So my goal that I'd like to reach, it's, it would just be an extrapolation of, pre, of past energy growth. Now, it's very easy to have a graph with 18 terawatts and 113 terawatts, but it's, you really have to viscerally understand how much energy that is. It's a tremendous amount of energy. Here's a picture of Mount St. Helens, uh, up near where I live in Seattle. It erupted in 1980 and spread ash and mud flows every which way, and so it released a lot of energy. Uh, human civilization right now uses one Mount St. Helens amount of energy every 93 minutes. That's all of us collectively. Uh, and by 2100, that's going to speed up to one Mount St. Helens every 15 minutes. So, um, you know, we're, we're, this is a very, very challenging problem, how to deliver this much energy to the people on the planet. Now, of course, power is a flow rate. It's an instantaneous rate. So energy is the integral of the power. So how much power do we need? Well, we're going to need something uh, about a yotta joule. I don't know if you know about yotta. It's beyond exa and zeta. We need, we're going to need about 0.2 yotta joules, or 0.2 times 10 to the 24th joules over the next 100 years. That's a lot of energy. A yotta joule is a lot of joules. Uh, 0.2 yotta joules is enough energy to boil off the Great Lakes 3.4 times over. And in fact, according to my calculations, 0.2 yotta joules is about five times the amount of energy consumed by humans since the beginning of civilization. So we're going to need a lot of energy in the next 100 years. Where is this going to come from? Well, one natural question to ask is, you know, we have a lot of energy technologies on the planet today. Will they be able to cover this 0.2 yotta joules? Can we use fossil fuels? They're pretty abundant. Can we do that? Or if we don't want to use fossil fuels, how about low carbon technologies or zero carbon technologies? Will, will those be able to generate 0.2 yotta joules? Well, let's consider these in turn. So the unfortunate thing about fossil fuels is they don't scale. It's not that they're not abundant. They're extremely abundant. For example, uh, humankind extracts one cubic mile of oil out of the ground every year. But unfortunately, when you, uh, burn car when you burn fossil fuels, you generate carbon dioxide and you place it into the atmosphere. And the best climate models that we have say that there's a severely limited amount of carbon dioxide that we can put into the atmosphere without warming things up. So um, here's a chart or a table of how much fossil fuel energy we can use after today and the corresponding rise in global mean temperature over 1850. And there's general consensus, there's uh, the Paris Treaty, uh, that we want to keep the global mean temperature no higher than 2 Celsius above 1850, which is at the end of the Little Ice Age. And that unfortunately means we can only supply 8% of the next 100 years consumption with fossil fuels. That's it. Then we run, in, we run out of budget. Uh, and even if you decide to be even more dangerous and go to 3 Celsius, it doesn't, doesn't actually make that much of a difference. We have to some zero carbon solution. Okay, what about zero carbon technologies? There's a number of them that exist. Uh, uh, 
solar power is getting increasingly common. Uh, people extract a lot of power from wind. There's other, other technologies you may not have heard of. There's a series of advanced fission technologies in the lower left graph. That's an example of something called a molten salt reactor. Or you can take uh, electric plants that generate, uh, that, are, that are, use fuel that are fossil fuels, and then just capture the carbon. You can scrub the carbon out of their flues, just like the carbon dioxide out of their flues, just like you scrub sulfur, uh, sulfur dioxide or nitrogen oxides. So will any of these be able to uh, cover 0.2 yotta joules? So here's, here's the thing. Uh, all those technologies I mentioned, all those zero carbon uh, t uh, sources, they're all, they all generate electricity, not fuel. And it turns out electricity generation is limited by its economics. So let me give you a brief tutorial about how the economics of electricity works. A very brief tutorial, it's a very deep subject, but just enough to sort of g give you a sense of what the limits are of zero carbon energy. So let's say you're your utility and you want to build an electrical plant. Your costs are going to be one of two styles. On the left, they're capacity costs. Those are costs you would uh, incur even if you generated no electricity. You have to build your plant and you have to uh, incur fixed costs. You have to hire people to work at your plant even if you generated no electricity. So the units of that kind of capacity cost are dollars per uh, peak power. And they're linear in the peak power. So uh, if you built a one gigawatt plant, it would cost about twice as much if you wanted to build a two gigawatt plant. Now let's say you wanted to start generating electricity. Uh, then you start incurring output costs. So if you have to burn fuel to make electricity, you, that's a linear amount of fuel for your, your electricity. And often maintenance is proportional to the amount of fuel, uh, electricity that you generate. So again, the units of that are dollars per uh, unit energy out. Now I'll show you a I'll, I'll re-explain this using a tool I call a power profile. So in a power profile, it shows you a time series of the output of all the plants of a certain type. Let's say this is all the natural gas plants in California that, are, that are share a grid. So on the x-axis is time. Here it's just spanning an, uh, a week. And the y-axis is power output. And you see these typically have uh, diurnal cycles. They go up and down every day. Now, that green line is the capacity. You can't generate more electricity than the capacity of the plant. And the capacity cost is proportional to that, how high that green line is, or the peak. The output cost is proportional to the area, the blue, the integrated area under the curve. And so uh, you, you get these two different costs, one that's proportional to the peak, and the other one's proportional to the area. And a very useful number to think about is something called the utilization, or sometimes called the capacity factor. And that is the total energy produced, that's the area under the blue curve, divided by the maximum energy you could have possibly produced, which is essentially the area under the green line. And that utilization is how you reconcile the capacity cost and the output costs because they have different units. So what you do is if you take the capacity cost, you're going, to, you're going to amortize it over each unit of output, and so you have to divide by the utilization. And when you sum that with the, the output cost, you get essentially a system cost per unit energy. So, uh, so the reason why I'm telling you this is I'm going to try to explain to you how electricity gets expensive and when renewable energy gets expensive. So let me tell you two ways that uh, electricity can be expensive to generate. You can take the same electrical plant here, uh, let's say you have one plant uh, uh, that operates at 60 gigawatts, and if you operate it mostly at capacity, uh, it's inexpensive because you amortize your capital across many, many joules of output. On the, on the right-hand side, let's say you only run your, your plant occasionally. In fact, there are such plants, they're called peaker plants. They only turn on when you have a peak in your demand, uh, then each joule of electricity is much more expensive um, because you're amortizing that, the, the cost of your capital across many fewer joules. The other way of making electricity more expensive is to waste the output of your plant. So this is, let's do this in the context of solar power, which is something called a variable power source. Uh, in a variable source, 
you don't get to choose when to turn your, your energy on and off. So for example, you don't get, uh, you don't get solar power at night, sorry. Um, so let's consider solar power. On the left, there's a new curve, which is the red curve, which is the demand that is imposed by people. So people are consuming power. And again, in the middle of the day, they consume more, and in the middle of the night, they consume less. In this case, you, uh, the uh, utility can choose to have a, uh, the capacity of their solar farms be about the same as the daily demand. And that's good, and you have inexpensive solar generation because all of those solar jewels are being used. The trouble is, there's a gap between the solar generation and the demand, so you have to fill that in with something else, like fossil fuel, so that's not so good. So you might want to decrease the amount of carbon in your grid by increasing the amount of solar. So what you do on the right is you would triple the capacity of the solar, and that's great for, uh, uh, that's great for uh, cloudy days like here at hour 60, you've tripled the number of output joules. But on the sunny days, you actually haven't tripled the number of output joules, you've just wasted it. This is called curtailment. And this is a way of actually making uh, solar power more expensive if you, if you force it to be on when the joules aren't needed. So, it turns out, I've given you analysis, I've shown you a couple of graphs where the utilization of the uh, electricity was done in isolation, but that's not right. Really, utilization is a system property. You have to estimate it for the entire grid. You have to estimate it for all technologies together, not just one technology in isolation. So here's an example. Uh, you have a green source. Uh, let's say it's renewables. It's some sort of variable uh, source. And you have a blue source, which is called dispatchable. You get to turn it on and off like you, as you wish. And that might be natural gas, electricity, or hydropower. So the, uh, the lesson here is as you increase the amount of variable generation, you get lower utilization and therefore you increase the cost of your electricity. So here's, here's two examples. On the left, the variable source in green is low. And so the, the peak required for the blue energy is that the height of that yellow arrow. And the utilization of the blue energy is quite high. You can see that it, it, the blue energy is mostly on. Now, if you want to increase the amount of variable generation you have, to, for example, to decrease the carbon, you end up not decreasing the capacity of blue very much at all, but you end up decreasing its utilization. So essentially, by changing the amount of green energy you have, you're actually affecting the economics of the blue energy. That's why you have to take an end-to-end -end view when you analyze the cost of electricity. So you can do that. Uh, there's been a number of papers in the field of modeling end-to-end -end system costs. We have a paper too. Um, the way those kind of end-to-end -end models work is you can model a grid for every hour of a year. And that is just a big linear program. It's not surprising it's a linear program because all of these costs are linear in these quantities like the peak or the, the sum. And uh, an extra thing we added in our paper was a what if. What if you wanted renewable energy to be 60% or 80%? Well, you can add a cutting plane algorithm to, uh, to force the system to find the minimum cost given that you need 80% uh, uh, renewable, say. So you can see our paper, look for the keyword DOSCO. Or if you're curious, uh, we have a, a, a live tool on GitHub called Energy Strategies that you can play with if you want to try different what ifs, try different policies or costs. So I welcome you to try that out and learn more. So let me tell you about one result we've got from do, you, running this model. So first I have to tell you the assumptions of, uh, from the model. So these are plausible assumptions from the, the of what the future might be like. Uh, so uh, solar power is decreasing in capital costs, so let's assume that it's gonna be about 60% of today's cost. The cost of storing electricity in giant batteries of some sort have, ha is going way down. So let's assume it's gonna go down by a factor of three. We'll also assume that natural gas is, is pretty inexpensive. In the, na in the United States, it's one of the, the uh, cheapest natural gas on the planet. So let's assume it's gonna go up a little bit, 20%. And then we're also going to model having high voltage power lines 
that will ship renewable energy across the country from places with a lot of wind to a little bit of wind. And then we're going to ask the model to uh, compute what the marginal system cost for renewables in California, but when you force them to have a fixed fraction and you can import en uh, renewable energy in from other regions. So here's the bottom line. The x-axis is the fraction of renewables. That's the, you, you enforce it in some way via some policy. And the y-axis is that system cost, the, remember the sum between the capacity and the output costs. So there's a few lines here to take note of. Uh, the, the solid black line is the cost of electricity from a new natural gas plant. That's the cheapest uh, uh, plant. It's about four cents a kilowatt hour. And you have to, and that four cents counts paying off the capital cost and also paying for the fuel. If you already have a paid off uh, natural gas plant, then the price drops to about two cents. So you don't have to, you don't have to amortize the capital cost. The blue and green lines reflect the marginal cost for adding the next kilowatt hour of renewables at that fraction. Blue is without storage and green is with storage. And you can see up to about, oh, 40%, uh, renewables actually beat new natural gas for electricity. That's, that's great. In fact, we're, we're seeing that. People are preferentially building renewable uh, power plants because renewables aren't very common. But as you start to approach 100% renewables, the cost explodes. And that's because of those two effects that I told you about, that they cause the other uh, variable, uh, the other dispatchable power to be more expensive and you have to start curtailing, you have to start wasting uh, renewable power. Many people hoped that storage, inexpensive storage, would solve this problem and make renewables great. And they help. They add like 5-10% to the, to the fraction of renewables if you stay at the same cost, but they don't solve the problem. So uh, this is a bit disappointing, but uh, here's the bottom line. Uh, it's just repeating what I just said, that they are competitive up to about 40%, but you can't expect renewables to compete with paid off fossil fuel. They're not below that black dash line. And there's another factor where there's something called industrial heat, where steel plants and concrete plants just burn fossil fuel just for the heat, not going through electricity. That's also about that same cost as that dashed line. And again, renewables can't displace that. So we can't rely on renewables to, to, to supply all of the 0.2 yada joules. We can rely on it to, support, to supply some of it. So what are we going to do? We're going to need to change the game. We're going to need to do something kind of crazy. So let's talk about radical research into zero carbon energy. So now we're going to have to look at less certain, more technically risky energy sources. And so we've been looking at ones that are enabled by new ideas or technologies that were uh, that weren't around 20 or 30 years ago. And what we're doing is we're hoping to accelerate this radical research uh, with all the advances we've had in computer science recently. So uh, to put it in context, I lead a group, as Sammy mentioned, called Applied Science at Google. And that's more general than energy. What we do in Applied Science is we try to attack various high-impact scientific problems in biology or physics and we work with domain experts in university and industry. We find the, the people who have some new idea. And then we take our expertise in large-scale computation or machine learning and go and help them on their scientific problem. So energy is one example of this. So we've been looking at energy, looking for, for different places to help. And we found one interesting place to help, and that's infusion energy. So let me now tell you a little bit about how fusion energy works. Uh, and why I'm hopeful about fusion energy, and also I can get into the nitty-gritty detail of, of how we're using machine learning to help fusion, which might make you happy since this is a machine learning conference. Um, okay, so let me tell you about fusion. Fusion is why the sun shines. Um, uh, so that's promising. So the sun is hot enough where uh, it's not made out of atoms, it's made out of plasma, where the, uh, it's so hot that the electrons separate from the nuclei. And at the sun's core, it's very intense. It's got a temperature of about 15 million Kelvin and has a pressure of about 250 billion atmospheres. And under these conditions, the nuclei actually fuse together. They smash into each other and they, for they form and they resplit into different nuclei. 
and those output nuclei have less mass than the input nuclei. And because of uh, Einstein's E equals mc squared, you get energy out. You get a lot of energy out. In fact, this is incredibly energy dense. So this 0.2 yotta joules we need for the next 100 years, if you, if you could fuse deuterium, that only requires 100,000 metric tons of deuterium, which can be found in six cubic kilometers of water. That's, for 100 years, that's really very feasible. Or if you, uh, if this proton-boron reaction turns out to be feasible, you only require 3.3 million metric tons of boron. That sounds like a lot, but it's only seven months of uh, world production of boron. So this fusion has the potential of being an inexhaustible energy source. So here's the problem. No one knows how to make it work. It's been pursued by 70, for 70 years, and it's a very, very, very difficult engineering problem, right? Because creating conditions like at the center of the sun is incredibly tough. Um, here's a picture I found from 1951 of some uh, physicists making a, pla a ring of plasma, and on the right-hand side, you can see it starts to get kinks because plasma likes to go unstable. It's very difficult to make a stable shape of plasma. Another problem that happens with plasma is you get heat loss. Remember, we're trying to make these uh, objects that have tens of millions of degrees temperature, and it's very easy for the heat to just leak away and, and the system to cool off. So despite literally decades of research, no one has ever gotten more energy out of a plasma than they've used to maintain a plasma condition. Now, there are many approaches to fusion. Uh, we're working on one of them, but just to review them briefly, there's sort of tokamaks. These have to do with like the shape of the plasma. That's the common one that's used, for example, in the European ITER project. Uh, so other people are thinking about inertial confinement where they actually take a little pellet of deuterium and uh, shoot laser beams at it and compress it until you get to fusion conditions. On the lower left, uh, there's a set of plasmas called compact toroids. I'll talk about that more in a minute. And interestingly, uh, uh, I don't know if you've heard of this, there's something called the Farnsworth Fusor. It was actually invented by the 60s, in the 60s by the same person who invented the television uh, set. And you can actually do fusion on your desktop, but you are forever doomed to uh, never get en more energy out than you get in. So, what are we doing? Well, we're, we're not fusion experts, so we've teamed up with uh, a company that are a bunch of fusion experts. The company is called TAE. And they've been around for almost 20 years, and they have specialized in this specific plasma architecture called an FRC, a uh, field reverse configuration. And they've been doing progressively larger, higher energy experiments into the FRC. There's a diagram of one of their machines on the right. And so we're working with them to uh, help apply computer science to see if we can accelerate their progress. Here's a picture of their latest apparatus from end on. It's actually quite a long apparatus. It's um, more than 20 meters long. Uh, this is the end. It, it, the, the, apparatus, the apparatus is named Norman because it's named after a Norman Rostocker who is a plasma physicist and one of the co-founders of TAE. So why, why did we choose TAE? Well, they have two really nice properties. One is they have, uh, speaking as a statistician or a machine learning person, they have they can, they can do rapid experimentation. In the last 20 years, they've built five machines, and they've accumulated uh, 70,000 experiments. They can actually do an experiment about once every 10 minutes. And in fact, on that Norman machine I showed you, they've done about 3,000 experiments since July. So it's a nice way to gather a lot of data and do a lot of exploration. Uh, the other reason why we like working with TAE is the data they've gathered so far suggests a good scaling law. So let me tell you what I mean by a scaling law. Uh, I'll, I'll describe it, but in, in summary, it's how difficult is it to get energy out of fusion? You can actually uh, write down very simple formulas that try to predict that. So let's get into that. Here's, it's always nice to be in a field where you have a metric, uh, and there's a metric for fusion success, and it's called Q. It's very simple. It's the ratio of the energy out that you get from fusion divided by the energy in, the energy you require to maintain those plasma conditions. And everyone is chasing after something called break-even, or scientific break-even, and that's when Q is greater than one. That will be a, quite an accomplishment. The highest Q so far was done by the, the JET uh, 
uh, tokamak. Very briefly, it attained Q equals 0.67 back in 1997. Now, remember, way back at the beginning of the talk, we want to compete versus fossil fuels. So it's not enough to just get a, a one extra joule of energy out after spending a billion dollars. So you really need to get a lot of energy out. You have to get uh, Q of five or even higher. Because the higher the Q is, essentially for the same capital cost, you get more watts, or reciprocally, you have less capital cost per watt. So remember, the capacity cost goes down. That means the system cost goes down, which means maybe we can compete with fossil fuels. So the hope is that, that, that uh, this FRC will give you very high Q. Now, what's the criterion? Uh, for Q equals one. It turns out that the fusion, the, the plasma physicists worked this out back in the 50s and the 60s. There's a, another criterion called the triple product, which is predicting when fusion can predict net energy. Uh, and that is a product of uh, the uh, uh, density of the, uh, of the plasma, which is the number of nuclei per unit volume, times the temperature of the nuclei, times something called the confinement time. The confinement time in units time, it's the amount of energy that's in the plasma divided by how quickly you lose your heat. And, de and depending on what your, your fuel cycle you have, there's some constant you have to be bigger than. And so if the product of those three numbers is bigger than some constant, you should be able to get Q equals one. So now this is where the scaling all comes in, because th these three numbers aren't independent. Uh, in fact, it's not surprising that because one, uh, tau is a heat loss and T is a temperature, they're related. So you need to have plasma that's both stable enough, in other words, it has to be long enough, and it has to be hot enough, and then you can actually get a net energy out. And it turns out there's two different kinds of scaling laws. If the, if the world is friendly to you, you get the green scaling law, where they're positively correlated, uh, uh, where as you make the temperature, as you make the plasma hotter, you, you uh, make it more stable. Otherwise, if you're in an unpleasant world, as you, you have to trade off temperature and heat loss. So uh, since you're trying to make the product of both of those be high, that's kind of unpleasant. As you make your, thing, as you make your plasma hotter, you lose on, on time or vice versa. So it, it, this is a very unpleasant place to be in. Preliminary data from TAE shows that this FRC plasma has this surprising scaling law where the, the confinement time actually goes up quadratically with the electron temperature. And that's, that is counterintuitive. It says that the higher your temperature is, the lower the heat loss rate. And it's a strange property of your plasma. It's, it's, it's sort of like saying that you have a bathtub and the more water you put into the bathtub, the less water comes out the drain. But it, it's a property of the specific architecture of the FRC if you go back and look at the same scaling law uh, for tokamaks, you do get, you're back into whack-a-mole. In other words, you have to trade off temperature and confinement, which is, again, a, a really tough problem. This is why tokamak engineering is not at all easy. So we're collaborating with TE, and we have two main goals. The, the first goal is we're, we're helping them with computer science to try to verify that scaling law. Remember, it, they've only verified it up to about a million Kelvin, we really need to uh, verify it up to tens of millions of Kelvin, so about one to two kilo electron volts. And then once we verify that scaling law, we really want to estimate that Q for the commercial reactor. In other words, is this, we're trying to estimate, is this actually going to be able to displace fossil fuels or not? So that's the collaboration, and that's a little tutorial about fusion. Now you may be wondering, well, what can, how can machine learning help? Well, there's two different projects we're working with TAE. One is essentially optimization, but it's really about exploration. And the other one is about inference. So let me go through both of those projects. So the first project is uh, a little bit like hyperparameter tuning, but not. It, that this Norman, here's a picture of the Norman apparatus, it has thousands of parameters, and they're not well characterized, because the way Norman works is you first inject gas at the two ends, and then you ionize the gas to make a plasma, and then you uh, you accelerate the two plasmas from both ends, and so you have to choose how quickly those accelerate. So there's a, a bunch of magnets that are accelerating the plasma. And once the two plasmas collide, you have to maintain that plasma in the center with a choice of magnetic fields and electric fields. And on top of that, you're shooting that plasma with neutral beams, so neutral beams of hydrogen, and you have to set uh, the uh, 
parameters of those uh, neutral beams. So I mentioned it was like hyperparameter tuning, but it really isn't. And I think actually what I'm about to describe is actually more general than fusion. I keep running into this. Uh, you don't really have a, a known space. It's not like you have a nice box that you can draw samples from. The physicists say, let's start here where the green star is. Um, and you just don't know. You know that there's, you know certain things because they built the machine. So there are certain parameter settings you just don't want to use. You know, you, you don't want to overload the power supplies and the capacitors. So don't go there. Don't go past the, where the red hyperplane is. But there are other settings that you can set the a machine to be that actually hurt the machine. So you have this beautiful machine and you run an experiment and a bright flash goes off. I've seen this. And then the physicists look very worried and they run out and they examine the machine and they might have to spend hours or days or, you know, in very worst case, weeks repairing the damage you just did by doing a bad experiment. So we want to be very careful about setting parameters that we, we don't want to break their machine. So really this is not an optimization problem. This is an exploration problem. We're trying to figure out uh, what's the shape of the polytope that, that is sort of safe to do experimentation. And it's not completely hopeless because it's as you get close to the edge that you can tell the physicists in the room get nervous. Uh, so they will tell you when you're getting close to the edge. They just don't quite know where the edge is. So in fact, we came up with something called the optometrist algorithm, which is uh, essentially Markov chain Monte Carlo, but with human preference on the inputs. And let me give you a little animation of how it works. So you start someplace, uh, and then you add a bit of noise with some parameter settings. So a, you set all the parameters. You add a little bit of noise, and the physicist said, that was great, never do that again. So you walk back and you do another perturbation, and that's better, it's more interesting. And it might be, there might be an objective metric, or there might be just subjectively the physicists like that more. So you perturb that again, oh, that's not as interesting. And you go back and, you, and you, that's even better. So what you're doing is you're sort of climbing a hill of human preferences with the physicists in the loop in the, in the control room uh, deciding on how to set the parameters. And uh, this seems to find both interesting regimes that were unexpected and avoids unsafe areas. So in fact, we did this on the previous machine to Norman, um, and we found this unexpected rising temperature regime that the TAE physicists didn't expect at all. They didn't expect their ion temperatures to actually grow to be one kilo electron volt. And they were actually very happy because that gave them confidence in actually building Norman, which is now built. Uh, so we published that. That's the first machine learning project. The second one has to do with inference. And it turns out that when you're trying to do this experimental plasma physics, you spend a lot of time debugging your plasma. Here's an image of your FRC plasma, and ideally it's perfectly stable in the center, but sometimes things go wrong. The, uh, the, the plasma tilts or wobbles around, or there's some pathway that lets the plasma cool off, or it might bounce and touch the walls. And the physicists want to know why did that happen? Well, it turns out they're not just doing things totally blind. There's many sensors, or what they call diagnostics, available. You can measure the magnetic fields, it's impossible, by the way, to touch the plasma because it's millions of degrees Kelvin, but you can do all these indirect measurements. You can actually use high-speed video cameras, uh, which have very wide field of view, but they are very narrow spectral band, or there's these things called bolometers, which can look at a very small uh, field of view, but integrate across all of the spectrum. There's even uh, a property called Thomson scattering. You can shoot a laser beam into the plasma and estimate its um, electron temperature along one line. So these are very sparse informative but very sparse both in time and space sensors and so of course we decided to do uh, a Bayesian inversion where we're trying to infer the hidden state of the plasma which consists of uh, the, where it is what's its shape what's its temperature and what density does it have again going back to that triple product and the way this works it's it's my, what you might expect from a Bayesian setup uh, we, we have a 3d probabilistic model of plasma or 2.5D if we're trying to make it be faster. And we have a generative model based on the actual, the, the physics of the sensors. We have a generative model of the sensor data. We, we uh, compare what the, what the generative model is predicting to the actual sensor data, and we use that as a feedback loop uh, to, to update the probabilistic model. But of course, that's sparse data. We can't, we're not doing maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, so we use a prior 
over the plasma state that involves uh, physics knowledge. So, for example, we enforce smoothness along magnetic flux lines. And the way that works is we, we, we do a relatively large-scale stochastic variational inference. So we assume a functional form over the posterior. So you may be familiar with this from variational inference. We maximize the elbow, the lower bound in the evidence, and we use stochastic gradient descent. And the nice thing that we use is TensorFlow. TensorFlow is a nice way to parallelize gradient descent. So we uh, map this Bayesian inference to 10 GPUs and uh, uh, essentially do variational inference. And the automatic differentiation part of TensorFlow is very handy because we have to take derivatives through this, this physics code. The nice thing about Bayesian inference is you can get error bars, uh, which is helpful to tell the physicist like whether you're, you actually know what's going on in the plasma or if you're just puzzled or if the algorithm itself is puzzled. But with variational inference, it doesn't give you good error bars, so we calibrate it using simulated plasma. The nice thing is we can get a solution in less than five minutes. So we're actually keeping up with the, the pace of experiments uh, that, that TAE is running. Here are just some preliminary results. Uh, given two cameras and all the magnetic sensors, we can reconstruct the emissivity in, other, how, in 3D, how much the plasma is glowing and what the magnetic field is in, inside the chamber. And this is ongoing work. We're going to uh, uh, place this plasma debugger live inside of their, their uh, their experimental loop. So looking forward to this collaboration, next year I call the year of science because going back to the scaling law, we're going to try to do everything we can to maximize that electron temperature and we're going to try to verify the scaling laws up to high temperature where we're getting close to actual fusion temperatures. And the outcome will be a, a, a precise estimate of Q at commercial scale. Then after that, uh, TE will build yet another machine uh, that will, if all goes well, will actually demonstrate break-even fusion, so that's exciting. Uh, and that engineering will also help us get uh, more precise costs about what fusion, how much fusion power will be. So, I worked on this project some. It was really fun. Are there other projects like this? Well, it's tricky, right? You want to solve, you want to work on a problem that has a lot of real-world impact. You don't want to just solve 0.001% of the climate problem. So you want to find a problem that can somehow displace or negate, say, 10% of the fossil fuel usage. But we're also machine learning and computation and statistics people, so we want problems that have a large number of experiments. It turns out it's, it's kind of hard to find projects in this intersection, but when you find them, they're really interesting. So I guess in conclusion, uh, just go back. We're going to have to figure out how to get 0.2 yotta joules of zero carbon energy somehow. One, there may be poss many possible pathways. One that we've identified is fusion energy. And we have combined fusion energy with machine learning. And hopefully we'll have a large impact in the world. We, we're not done yet, but we have hope. And the question I want to leave to the audience is where, where else can ML help? There might be other pathways to get to the 0.2 yada joules. So that's my talk. Thanks, Sean, for this uh, great talk and a bit scary as well. We have uh, plenty of time for questions. So there are mics in the, all the aisles. Uh, please come to the mic and ask all the questions you would like to. Hi. A um, couple questions. Um, first, just you talked about fusion. What about fission? Um, oh, you can't hear me? Yeah. Um, but actually, I have another question I'm a little bit more interested in. This is just a basic question about the mechanics of fusion. So as, you add, as the fusion is taking place, the original uh, molecules or would it be mo yeah, molecules that you had are being replaced by these other molecules, right? That's how the energy is produced. So do you need to like, add more of the original mixture of molecules? That, that's right. There's something in fusion. The, the question was, uh, do you have to sort of keep feeding fuel in? Well, it, it's slow because it's so high energy density, but it does have, accumulate something called ash. That's what they call it. I mean, it's like a wood fire, except it's fusion. Um, and so you do have to occasionally uh, restart the reactor and have more. I mean, it depends on the fuel, right? Uh, 
deuterium tritium is complicated. I can tell you offline, but, but you do have to, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a perpetual motion machine. You do have to, you know, keep feeding fuel in. Uh, and you asked about fission or? Yeah, just do you think that has a role to play as well, just because you didn't mention it at, at all in the original talk? That I oh, yeah, sorry. It, I had a limited amount of time. I could go on, I can go on for this for hours. Um, advanced fission, the future cost of advanced fission is very uncertain. The most optimistic estimates say that it could displace, similar to re renewables, new plants, but not old plants. So uh, part of the reason why I didn't bring it up is I've been scratching my head. There doesn't seem to be a, a very good large experiment thing to try there. So it just wasn't, you know, there just wasn't anything I could try. But it, 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 it does have a future in the, it does have a future in, as part of that point to you out of Jules, if it becomes cheap enough. Hi, thanks so much for a great talk. I was wondering about the renewable energy, uh, the graph where you show that um, the cost of increasing renewables in actually increases the cost of per unit of energy produced, be only because of the mainly because of the variability of renewable energy. Um, and so I was wondering if you think it's realistic to target the variability of renewable energy and if that would give like similar gains to uh, any other pros proposed solution. Yes, you exactly identified the problem. It's the variability. If you could figure out how to get renewable energy that was what they call base load, which is 24 seven, that would solve the problem. Uh, in fact, that model, that's part of the reason why I mentioned the HV DC, the HV, sorry, high voltage DC lines across, because uh, if you import wind energy from the Midwest to California, it actually balances, it's sort of a, a it, the noise balances out and the variance reduces. So that actually does help and you definitely need to do cross-continental wind importation above about 50% wind. But it's just hard to get it to be a perfect flat. But I if you could somehow come up with renewables that was baseload, problem solved. What about geothermal? Oh, geothermal? Okay. So the question was, what about geothermal? So, <sighs> I wish, okay, geothermal's great, uh, but it's only cost effective in what they call hydrothermal areas. So in other words, areas which are uh, uh, very, uh, that already have a lot of water passing through them. There's something called uh, dry rock geothermal, where you actually inject water down, and there's been some work on it. But the trouble is the, the economics just don't work out. There, it, it just will, it'll be roughly as expensive as today's nuclear power, which is very uncompetitive. Because you're right, I mean, there's, there could be a vast amount of geothermal uh, if you can, the trouble, it all boils down to five kilometer wells, which get you down to 300 Celsius, cost a lot of money. And it just isn't, it just doesn't compete economically. It's just a shame. So, so you're limited to the amount of geothermal you get out of hydrothermal. Hi, uh, I'm a data scientist with Shell. And my question is, what are your thoughts on distributed energy generation and distributed grids? And a lot of people see it as a big potential opportunity for machine learning and deep learning to optimize grids. So the question was about uh, distributed energy. I had to cut that from my talk for time. Um, that might raise, okay, there's good and bad things. That might raise the amount of renewables because the cost point is not the cost of the natural gas, it's the cost that you pay to the utility, which residentially might be 11 cents a kilowatt hour, or if you're uh, industrial at seven cents. The, the downside is, is that you can't average, if, if you're just hoarding the electricity by yourself, if you're not part of a grid, you have, to, you have to make your own capacity that covers your own peaks. Now there have been proposals, in fact, uh, back in 2014, there was an invited, yeah, 2014, there was an invited talk by Arun Majumdar about, bo about bottom-up grid, uh, uh, where he was talking about that. But, uh, uh, it, but it, w it, what it does, it might be able to increase the, the uh, renewables above 40%, but then you actually have this thing called, it's like adverse selection, where as more and more people detach from the grid, the grid, it, the grid becomes more and more expensive, and that means more people will detach from the grid. So it's, I, I don't know how it's gonna end up, but 
it is possible it might go above 40% if distributed, uh, uh, things like distributed PV become common. Just a quick uh, follow-up question. Do you see there's an opportunity for machine learning to optimize peak loads uh, for distributed grids? Uh, it, the question is, is there machine learning? Uh, maybe there might be if you're trying to predict, I mean, if you, if for distributed, you might be trying to predict how to charge and discharge your own battery, maybe. I don't know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to uh, go on to the next event, and let's uh, thank John once again. If you, have, if you have additional questions, come up now. Now, I'd like to invite everybody to the Pacific Ballroom. The information theorist at Caltech, and I thought that Ed was particularly interested in energy, so it was particularly, I think, appropriate.